Okay, this morning's message is the just shall live by faith. We're going to talk a little bit about faith. And originally I was kind of planning to do somewhat of a, just a milky message on this. And then you actually start to look at the word faith in the Bible and you start realizing, well, here's a reference and there's a reference and there's another one, there's another one. So it's not going to be a real long message, but it's going to be a little bit more than a milky message. So the best verse, in my opinion, on faith is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. What is faith? You can go there a while. Uh, we're not going to read all of the definitions, but if you have a Webster's 1828 dictionary, there are 12 uh, meanings to the word faith. Okay, 12 references, which I think is kind of interesting because you have 12 tribes, 12 Jewish tribes that show up in the Great Tribulation. Um, and then you also have 12 divided by 2 is two sixes. <coughs> How many books are in the Bible? 66. <laughs> you know, so uh, just some interesting things. But the two types of faith that we're going to look at today is our faith in God and His Word, and secondly, our faithfulness to God. Okay? Same basic word, but there's two different meanings there. You have to f have faith. You have to believe in something that you can't see. But then you also have to be faithful. You know, loyal, essentially, is what that means. But let's start out here. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, we are to walk by faith, not by sight. We're going to see that in just a minute here. But is faith something, do you have to, or can you have faith in something that you can see? It doesn't require any faith. It's the evidence of things not seen. Okay, you can't see Jesus Christ. You, there isn't, you can't say that there was a day when I was walking along and all of a sudden this guy walked out and, oh, here's Jesus. And he says, will you accept me or reject me? And you say, well, I see you, so I guess I'll accept you. No, that never happened. You have to believe by faith. And we're going to see that in just a couple minutes here. Okay. Uh, John, turn to the book of John next. John chapter 20. John 20, verse 24 through 29. We're going to see this thing about sight versus faith. John 20, 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other, the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, uh, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. You know, there are a lot of people that are like that today. Well, I just don't know. I mean, if you could prove to me the existence of heaven, or if you could prove to me the existence of hell, which you can, but then they'll deny that. You know, if you could prove to me that God exists, so if I could see God, maybe then I'd believe. See? Uh, there's a lot of Thomases still around. Verse 26 and after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. I guess you'd need to say that if if uh, you all of a sudden just appear in a room <laughs> when the doors were shut. You know, you'd have to say, Hey, peace, it's okay. <laughs> you know. Uh, verse 27, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Was Jesus God manifest in the flesh? Absolutely. Yes, he was. <coughs> but now look at what Jesus says. Jesus isn't, you say, well, there's a, there's a time where Jesus showed himself physically. Why couldn't he do it today? Well, look at verse 29. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You know, you'd say, well, I'm, as a Christian today, I certainly am not on the level of the twelve disciples. Well, I don't know about that. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. 
we get a special blessing because we believe by faith. Those 12 disciples believed on Jesus by sight. You know, well, Judas, you know, he didn't make it. But the point is, you know, we have a special blessing because we have faith in what we cannot see. All right, now turn to Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. <clears throat> All right. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That right there, there's a, a reference or two in the Old Testament that have those exact same wording there, the just shall live by faith. That's what got to Martin Luther. You know, that was his main thing, the just shall live by faith. And that went through his mind because you see back in his day, and it's even true today, but really true of back then when the Catholic Church was in control, they ruled the people by sight, not by faith. The people were not taught to believe in things that they couldn't see. They were taught to believe in things they could see. Well, the, here's the Pope, the Holy Father, the Vicar of Christ, the visible head of, of the church. See, it was all by sight. Look at this great temple. Look at this great cathedral. Look at these great statues. Bow down to the statues. It was all sight. The just weren't living by faith. Okay, it was sight. And so Martin Luther saw that and he went, wait a second, the just shall live by faith. And faith is the evidence of things not seen. Hmm. And he began to realize, hey, this church is corrupt. And Martin Luther got out of it. And you say, oh, well, Martin Luther had his problems. Yeah, he did. But, you know, it wasn't like there was a local Baptist church that he could go talk to the pastor and get straightened out in all of his doctrines or something. I mean, Martin Luther, for his time, was, you know, very good. Yes, he had some doctrinal problems, but the point is, it was the faith there that he began to see hey this church the catholic church is not right i'm to live by faith the just shall live by faith all right now go to romans chapter 10 we're going to see about our salvation here romans chapter 10 verse 9 through 13 It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Whosoever. By the way, notice there it says, it doesn't say whosoever of the elect. Okay, don't ever fall for the lies of Calvinism. John Calvin was another man that was back about the time of Martin Luther, a little bit after Luther. And he came up with this, excuse me, but idiotic theory that God only died, or, you know, Jesus only died for a certain number of people, and, that, and if you're not one of the elect, then you can't get saved. Well, nonsense. That's And right there, Romans 10.13 is one of the verses that debunks uh, Calvinism. Romans 1.16 does too. The first one that used, everyone that believeth. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's so many verses. Yeah. In, I mean, everyone that believeth, yeah, I mean, good point. The Romans 1.16 there. There's so many verses in the Bible that talk about whosoever. You know, anyone. I mean, it's Calvinism is just a stupid theory. Uh, there's no, really no nice way to put that. But look at verse 17. Jump down to verse 17 there. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Where does your faith come from? See, it's not blind faith that we have. We just kind of, I'm, I'm just telling you what I believe or something. No, we have an authoritative standard. It's not total blind faith that we just have to believe in something without any evidence at all. We have a written account. Okay? And it's interesting because, you know, you read a history book sometime and you say, well, I believe that there's people out there that would believe a history book about the Revolutionary War, but yet they won't believe this book. 
And you say, well, yeah, but the Revolutionary War, that's that actually happened. How do you know? How do you know? You've got to accept it by faith. You weren't there. You know, they didn't, they weren't shooting video back then, you know. You have to accept by faith that George Washington existed. He could have been made up, see. You can make the same arguments for a history book that people make against this book. But see, the difference between the history book and the Bible is that the Bible talks about sin, and it talks about hell, and it talks about judgment. That's the reason people don't want to believe the Bible. There's no scientific reason to not believe the Bible. The atheist is an atheist because of sin and judgment and hell. They don't like that. That's why they claim to be an atheist. Um, but anyhow, let's continue on here. First uh, John chapter 5. My question for you this morning is, do you trust the Bible? And some people say, well, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect translation. All, all translations have errors. They're all, you know, there's no such thing. Okay, then how do you know you're saved? All translations have errors. You know, the King James Bible's an error, a lot of people say. Okay, then what is the standard, what is the authority that proves that you are saved? I mean, if, if the King James Version is an error, 1 John 5, 7, and the last 12 verses of the book of Mark, all those places are an error, then how do you know that the verses on salvation aren't in error? So you, can't, you cannot approach the book with a skeptical, critical attitude. If you do that, then you really have no assurance of salvation. And, and you say, yeah, but I know a lot of guys that have that, and yet they have assurance of salvation. No, they're hypocrites, they're liars, they're fakers. Okay, they're, they are con artists. All right, that's what these new versionists are. Uh, they're going around professing something that they don't really believe. But you say, well now, uh, how can we prove that we are saved? Well, these are some verses that you should have memorized as a Christian. 1 John chapter 5, verses 10 through 13. It says here, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Well, what's the record? And this is the, the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now look at that. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. <clears throat> so what's the record? Well, it's a feeling. It's, it's just a, it's a good, warm feeling. That you, no. It's written. God is not going to leave you without a written account that you are saved and that you can know that you are saved. I just want to hold up something here. Now, you can't see this for those of you on the recording. What is this? This is my title to my truck. You say, well, you know, if, if I'm driving the truck down the road someday and I, and I get pulled over by a police officer and he says, uh, I need to see your owner's card. I don't have one. Uh, do you have proof of insurance? I don't have that either. Well, uh, is this your truck? Well, I hope so, you know. <laughs> Uh, well, do you do you have any kind of written proof that that truck is yours? No, but I feel it's mine. You know, I feel good about it. I, I'm pretty sure, you know. Well, guess what? It's not going to be my truck anymore. <laughs> and I'm probably going get, to get to ride in a police car, you know. <laughs> and my truck's going to go to the impound lot. Now, if the secular world has enough sense to give you a written record of something like owning a truck, why do you think that Almighty God wouldn't give you a written record of salvation? So it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But yet, the majority of these new version, modern apostate Christians, that's exactly what they believe. God has not given us a perfect written record. We just have multiple translations. You can use whatever you feel like using. They're all in error. None of them are perfect. But you just kind of go with what feels right. Wrong. No, that's not what the Lord intended. Okay, let's go on to the next thing here. Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one verses five through seven. <clears throat> We're going to see the progression. Okay, so we see 
You get saved by faith. All right? When you get saved, it's by grace through faith. You are believing in Jesus who you can't see. Okay? And you have to have faith in the written word of God. You can see the written word of God, but you still have to have faith that it's true. Okay, but now what comes after the salvation? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence and add to your faith, there's your salvation, your faith in Christ. Add to your faith virtue. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. After you get saved, after you got saved, after you've professed to be saved, does it change your life morally? Do you become a good person? Well, it better. It should. You should be a virtuous person. You shouldn't be a lying, cheating, stealing, you know, whatever. You should be good morally. Oh, then you're saying Christians don't sin. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying there should be a difference there. A Christian should not be a liar or a, you know, perpetual liar or cheater or or stealing things. But then let's continue here. And to virtue, knowledge. What good is knowledge if you don't have virtue first? You know, there are a lot of people that have a lot of head knowledge and they use it to steal money from people. We call them cell evangelists. <laughs> people on TV that steal money. They got a lot of head knowledge, but they don't have much virtue. I mean, can you... I can personally not imagine standing up in front of a crowd and lying to those people out there and seeing those elderly people out there, they're living on their retirement money and knowing that I'm stealing their money. Or seeing going like a Benny Hinn and seeing these sick people out there in the audience and saying, I, God can heal you today if you just have enough faith and, and give enough seed offering. And you see those poor people handing their money in and you know they aren't going to be healed. You know you don't have the power, but you're stealing their money. See, knowledge is no good without virtue. And a lot of those cell evangelists, I don't believe, are saved either. Let me just make that point. So you have to have virtue, then knowledge. Verse 6, and to knowledge, temperance. Now, what is temperance? That temperance is basically, the, there's another word in the Bible, moderation. Temperance and moderation are very similar. Don't eat too much, don't eat too little. Don't sleep too much, don't sleep too little. Don't work too hard, don't work not at all. I mean, you have to be temperate. You have to balance things out. That's also very important. And to temperance, patience. Oh, that's easy to be patient. No, it is not. <laughs> that's very difficult. Especially when you start getting into ministry. It's so easy to just, somebody writes you an email and you, <clears throat> you want to just nail them. You have to be patient. You don't know what angle they're coming from. You know, I had a guy, I just put up two new videos on YouTube, and I had a guy write, and it was a negative email, and I was like, I was going to nail the guy, and I said, no, patience, you know. And so I wrote a nice thing back to him, and he wrote back, and he said, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't know you were trying to make that point or whatever. I see what you're saying now. You know, I, I take back what I was saying. See, he didn't mean to be bad or, or, you know, he wasn't trying to, to disprove me or anything. He just was confused on the point I was making, you know. Now, you need to have some patience, okay? And, and long-suffering also comes in there, too. But uh, let's continue here. And to patience, godliness. How godly are you as a Christian? You know, do people see uh, godliness in your life? Um, Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Do you fear God? I mean, when you get around people, do you fear them more than God? That's another reason why a lot of people aren't King James Bible believing, because they fear man instead of God. That's a lot of, another reason why a lot of people don't witness, why a lot of people aren't willing to, to take stands for Jesus Christ, because it's displeasing to the world. And so they'd rather not bear the reproach of Jesus Christ. They'd rather go and, and stand by the world. You know, just amazing. Continuing here, verse 7, And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And notice the progression. This is, this is the higher up the ladder of sanctification you get. And you have brotherly kindness up there. 
And that kind of goes along with the patience things, but, but it's even above, up above the thing of patience is to have brotherly kindness. And that's real tough too. You get somebody that, that just can't stand you and they're attacking you and they're saying bad things about you and everything. It's real hard to be meek and to take that. You know, sometimes you have to, you have to hit back, you know, certainly, but there are other times that you just need to, all right, well, sorry, I couldn't help you. Go away. That's tough. That's not easy. Um, <clears throat> turn to, just keep your hand there, but turn quick to Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. Here we're going to see a good example of brotherly kindness. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 13 says, But ye brethren, be not weary in well doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. How do you accomplish that in a church building with everybody welcome? Uh, verse 15, Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. There are Christians out there that for one reason or another, they're messed up doctrinally, they're in rebellion against the Lord, and you're not to have company with them, but you don't just, you know, condemn them. He's a heretic, I'll have nothing, you know, to do with it. You're to admonish him as a brother. You know, you're to say, well, you know, you don't agree with the Bible version issue here, you're not a King James Bible believer, well, I do think that you're saved, but you need to study this issue more. And just go away from them. I mean, the Bible solution is not that we all get together and, and talk out our differences, you know. The Bible solution is if somebody does not submit to the truth, admonish them as a brother, but do it at a distance. You don't all come together and fellowship together because if compromise is made in a church situation, it's usually to the wrong side. Very seldom do you have compromise from the wrong side, the world of the, the, the flesh very seldom will compromise and go to the spiritual. They almost always will drag you down to their level. You allow some contemporary Christian music into your church, it will drag down and eventually you're going to have, it'll start out a traditional service and a contemporary service. And then it goes to, well, the, you know, that's kind of difficult, it's a little bit much, so let's just combine it into one service and we'll kind of have both contemporary and traditional songs. We'll have one of each. Well, no, maybe we ought to have two contemporary songs. Next thing you know, you got a rock band in your church. You know, well, I think that we should just, you know, people, it's okay if people carry new versions into the church. You know, that's no problem. Let's not talk about it from the pulpit. Let's not, bat, you know, belittle the uh, people that use the new versions. Let's not say anything bad. Well, maybe it'd be okay if we taught a class now and then from an NIV. Well, maybe it's okay if we preach the NIV. Well, why don't we get rid of the King James versions? See, it's always your compromises are always going down. Okay? And I mean, look at the churches in America, look at the churches anywhere. You don't need, you know, to just believe me. You know, it's it's not by faith, <laughs> by sight. You know, just look at the churches. Look how they've compromised things that would have never been accepted 100 years ago now are commonplace. You know. So, even 10 or 20 years ago, things have changed so rapidly. But anyhow, go back to Second Peter again. We'll finish up the thing there. And look at the last one. Verse 7, And to brotherly kindness, charity. Uh, we won't bother turning there, but uh, Colossians 3.14 says about charity is the bond of perfectness. <clears throat> so I don't think anybody can be perfect. Well, if you have charity, you can get pretty close. Charity is self-sacrificing love for somebody or something okay charity is not just plain love there needs to be a self-sacrificing there that's what charity is and charity is the end that's the top of the ladder of sanctification as a christian where you're thinking about other people more than yourself oh that's not that hard to do uh, i don't know about that that's a lot more difficult than you'd think but look at verse 8 for if these things be in you and abound, 
They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now, you know, the one verse in the, in the Bible talks about laying up treasures in heaven and not on this earth. You see there it says in verse 9, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. What is the afar off? That's eternity. Well, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta have my my life here. I gotta have my best life now. <laughs> you know, it, no, it's about heaven. And if you want to have a fruitful Christian life, you will pay attention to verses five through seven, and you will make that your standard. And you will go through this list here. I mean, there are a couple places in Scripture that you ought to go through occasionally and just kind of check yourself and say, "How am I doing?" And if you're not doing too good, well, then you're probably being barren and unfruitful. And you need to think about that. Okay, uh, speaking of fruit, we'll go here to another place that you should go through occasionally. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. And you have nine fruits of the Spirit mentioned here. Okay, Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Okay, so you have nine fruits there. Now count them. Count out there. Okay, first you have love. Then you have joy. Then you have peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. What number is faith? Seven. Seven. Isn't that interesting? A number that's most associated with, with God and, and things that the Lord does. Seven is the, is the number the, the, of the fruit of the Spirit there that is faith. Okay, now we're going to go to Titus. Titus chapter 1. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk now about our faithfulness. Okay, we see what faith is. Faith is something that you have to believe or you have to have in something that you can't see. All right, now, what about your faithfulness? Titus chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And here's instruction for a preacher, a, a pastor. Excuse me. Verse 6. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Now look at verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. How many preachers have dis been disqualified there in verse 9 today? Most. Most. Exactly. You have Baptist preachers that are now going to mega charismatic rock and roll churches what happened they didn't hold fast the faithful word even if you go to a, a fundamentalist baptist college or something like that that they teach the king james bible but they don't really believe it you know even if you go to a you know i'm a fundamentalist even that i'm not even you know it, it'd be better if you were a bible believer but even if you see these fundamentalist guys that i you know I have issues there, but even those guys are dropping like flies. They're, they're not being faithful to the word. And it's a lowercase w there. It's not capital W. Okay, it's the written word of God. Whenever you see a lowercase w, that's the written word. But they're not holding this book fast. They're not faithful to the word of God. They're backing off. They're going with the new versions. They're going with the new music, the new standards. They're falling away, even from their you know training that they had. Okay, turn to Second Timothy chapter four. Actually, right over the page there, Second Timothy chapter four, verses six through eight it says, "For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand." I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So you see there, Paul kept the faith. He was faithful. You didn't see Paul starting a rock and roll church. You didn't see Paul falling away. He was faithful right up until the end. You know, we saw uh, Ruckman, Dr. Peter Ruckman, uh, down in Delaware here a couple weeks ago. And I think he said it's now 60 years or so that he's been in ministry. And he preaches the same and he uses the same book and he's, he's the same as, I mean, I have videos from him back in the 1950s and he's the same man. Why? He's holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. And he has also kept the faith. He isn't backing down. That's the way it's supposed to be. You know, and, and just keep your, well, we'll go back here quick. You don't have to keep your hand there. Um, cause we're going to be turning somewhere else, but go back to Proverbs chapter 31. I actually didn't have this in my notes, but the, this kind of came to me this morning and the Lord kind of was showing me some things here. Proverbs chapter 31. Now, what is Proverbs 31 about? Virtuous yeah, a virtuous woman. And I want to show you something here. Verse 10, Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10 says, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing. In relationship to Christ, who are we? According to like Revelation 19, the first couple of verses of Revelation 19. We are the bride of Christ. Now, how often does the Lord have to give you things, answered prayers and keep things going good for you to remain faithful? It's kind of rough, isn't it? See, a faithful wife is one that will remain faithful even if she's not getting her way. Even if she is not married to a rich man. Even through adversity, she'll remain faithful. And her husband doesn't have to buy her a brand new fur coat or buy her jewelry or a new Mercedes to keep her faithful. She'll be faithful to him through thick and thin. And the husband doesn't have to spoil her. How is your faith when the Lord does not answer your prayers? How is it when things start going rough, when you start getting down? It's rough, isn't it? You know? How quickly do you fall away? How quickly do you lose faith? You know? Something to think about. Alright, now we're going to go back to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to spend some time here in Hebrews 11. Then we'll be turning to one other place and then we're done. But Hebrews chapter 11 is one of the chapters that's uh, probably one of the best chapters on the subject of faith. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Okay, now look at verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, very interesting if you study the whole thing of Enoch. Enoch was taken out before God's wrath was poured out on this world the very first time. God's wrath has only been poured out or will only be poured out two times on the whole earth. Okay, the first time was the flood. That was a worldwide flood. It was not a local flood in the days of Noah. Okay, the second time is going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the second time that the whole world is going to be judged. Okay, I was thinking of a third time there at the end of the millennium, but that's just the people come up. When Satan's loosed, they come up and they compass the city of Jerusalem and the fire comes down and devours them. So that's not worldwide. It's just a local thing. But you have two worldwide judgments, the flood in the days of Noah and the great tribulation or time of Jacob's trouble, if you want to call it that. Now, a faithful man was taken out 
before the flood. He was removed. He was translated. Raptured, you might say. Enoch. Okay? And I've done, in my uh, uh, pre-tribulation rapture studies, I talk a little bit more about it, so I'm not going to get into it here. But God is going to take away his faithful bride. Okay, those who are truly saved, he's going to take them away before the time of Jacob's trouble. But look at verse 6 there. It says, without faith it is impossible to please him. You know, I was back and forth with this guy on the Bible version issue, and and he was asking all these questions. Well, how do you answer this? And how do you answer that? And how do you? And I I answered him, and I but I said, you know what? You got to just get to a point where you believe this book by faith. God is not going to give you all the answers to defend Christianity or to defend the King James Bible, or even the pre-tribulation rapture. God is not going to give you every single answer out there. You just got to get to a point where you say, okay, I've looked at both arguments. This one makes sense. This one doesn't. I'm going to believe by faith. Yeah, but what about this? So yeah, what about that? You know, whatever. I believe by faith. And this guy that I was writing back and forth with, he later totally rejected the King James Bible. Now he's making videos attacking the King James Bible. And, uh, and he told me, he wrote back and he said, faith isn't enough for me. Well, he has to believe by faith that the new versions that he now defends, he has to believe by faith that they're right. He can't answer all the attacks on them. But see, his flesh desires the thing of not having final authority. So he grabbed at the thing of, of James White and the critical people that attack the King James Bible. He, he grabbed at that. See, he doesn't want to live by faith. And verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. If you don't have faith, if you say, I don't, I don't, I don't live by faith. I, I, uh, I live only by sight, only what I can see, only what I can prove. You'll never please God and you'll never be just. The just shall live by faith. All right. <clears throat> now jump down to verse 23, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. See, they weren't afraid of the king's commandment because they didn't have Romans 13. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. Romans 13 says about that rulers are not a terror to good works but to the evil. Okay, when you have a king that comes out and he says, I want you to kill all the firstborn sons. That's the kind of commandment that you don't follow. If they ever have forced abortion here in America, as a Christian, you better not submit to that. As a Christian, you have your baby through a, a midwife or something, and you keep your baby away from the, the government murderers. Now, we're not quite at that point yet. They have it in China. In China, they have forced abortion. But here in America, we don't have it quite yet. But they're trying for it. There are powerful elite people that are saying that there's too many people on the earth and we got to reduce the numbers of human population and everything. And they want you to be forced to have an abortion. Now, if that ever comes down as a rule and your husband and wife there and your wife becomes with child, you don't say, well, the government says we have to kill our baby. No. At that point, the rulers are now a terror to good works. Okay, they're now evil. And you as a Christian say, no, I don't think so. Verse 24, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Hmm. Well, you can certainly make application to today, the modern church. They want to enjoy the, the pleasures of sin for a season. And that's all it is. Verse 26, Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Let me just say something here real quick. Moses was, you know, living in the palace, you know, very, very wealthy, very rich. And it would take a lot of faith. You know, God says, I want you to go and I want you to set my people free. And, and you know, he flees out into the wilderness That'd be kind of tough for a, a kid that was raised <laughs> in wealth and luxury. 
you know, you have some multi-million dollar kid today and he, and he goes running out into the mountains and kind of has to rough it for a while. <laughs> you know, that would take a great degree of faith. Um, let's continue on here. Verse 28, Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling, sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying to do, were drowned. Okay, two things there. The faith, uh, first of all, uh, keeping the Passover. And, of course, that would be important later because the perfect Passover lamb that was slain was Jesus Christ. Okay, but it's interesting there that Pharaoh said, I want you to kill all the firstborn. And Moses' parents said, no, I don't think so. And God actually turned that thing around and went right back on Pharaoh and killed his firstborn. <laughs> Uh, the Lord, you know, will take care of, of greedy, wicked politicians. You don't have to worry about that. Um, verse 29, though, it says about, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. I think that would take some faith. Here's the sea, and God says, I want you to go across it, just go down, you know, and, and I'll, don't worry, I'll, I'll open the thing up, and you're walking along there, and there's water on each side. It's a great de degree of faith. Would you have believed it? If you had been there, would you have walked through that thing by faith, thinking, you know, is this water going to come down on me at any second? You know, it's kind of interesting. Oh, I, just, I wish God would, would do things by sight today. Uh. <laughs> uh. It wasn't this thing of, oh, it's so obvious now, you know. It still took a great degree of faith, you know, especially when you know that there's an army right behind you coming to kill you. And there you are crossing the sea. Okay. Um, I just want to say something here as, before we continue on. And that is we are rapidly approaching a time where, where the government here in the United States, and of course anywhere in, in the world really, but in the USA especially, is going to start passing unscriptural laws. And we're not going to be able to obey them. They're talking about hate crimes and stuff like that. You can't speak against sodomy. You can't obey that. Okay. Oh, then that means that we can be lawless and we can just do what we want and we can, you know, disobey speed limits. And no. There are still just laws out there. And there are still good police officers out there that you should submit to. Okay. If you're doing something wrong and you get pulled over by a police officer, submit to him. Okay. He is the law. Okay. If he is a terror to, you know, bad works that you just did. <laughs> then, you know, you're the one that's, that's going to have to pay for that. But uh, when times get rough, and right now it's so easy to talk about this, it's easy to think about it, but what happens when they announce that, you know, you're going to have to have forced abortion, you're not going to be able to talk about sodomy anymore, all Christian bumper stickers need to be removed, all Christian gospel tracting has to be ended, and if you're caught... You're going to go to prison. And you're probably going to be tortured there. Now, at that point, it's all illegal now to be a Christian publicly. And you can only go to government-mandated churches. And God says, uh, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'd like you to take some tracks out. Are you going to have faith that God will protect you? Or are you going to say, well, you know... Powers that be ordained of God, you know, I, I, I gotta, I gotta submit, I, you know, I have to take my bumper stickers off my truck now because it's, it's now illegal. And I can't say anything bad against sodomy because, you know, I might lose my government church, you know. How's your faith gonna do? And we might still be here, you know. I, we believe pre-tribulation rapture here definitely, but we might still be here when some of these laws are passed. Are you going to live by faith at that point? Or are you going to cower away like most of the Christians are going to do in America and, oh, well, I, I have to submit. I have to submit. Or are you just going to keep on doing the will of the Lord regardless of what it costs you? Something to think about. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. Here's an interesting one. For all these modern day Pharisees that talk about people that have had sins in their past and everything, and you have to be somehow sinlessly perfect to be in ministry. Verse 31, By faith the harlot 
Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. You mean God would write well of a harlot? <laughs> That's correct. You see, God will wash away the sins of anybody. Okay, there's no sin that's sinner that's too great for the Lord to forgive. All right, now look at verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthi and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Hmm, interesting. Out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. And that does not mean that they were space aliens coming down in UFOs and they fought them. Okay, that means aliens as in people that were coming into Jerusalem and trying to fight and trying to besiege the city. And I'm going to be real honest with you. Uh, we're looking at that same problem here today. We are now looking at, I, I recently heard that, you know, people say illegal aliens. Well, I heard a guy recently say illegal invaders. <laughs> you know, you're looking at people coming into this nation that are not hardworking. They just want to live off of the American people and they want to steal. And I don't hate Spanish people. I don't hate people from Mexico. I would openly welcome having Spanish neighbors. You know, I've been down a couple times on mission trips and stuff. I love the people. They're, they're good people. But you go down to Central America, there's a reason why they have bars on their windows and gates around their homes. They steal from each other. It's part of their culture. Well, guess what? They come up here to America, and right now they don't have to steal. They don't have to riot. They don't have to loot because they're being paid to live here. Welfare. Okay, And there are some that are good. There are some that are here. They want to become citizens. They want to work. They want to contribute to the American way. Fine. That's great. Welcome to America. Definitely. But when you sneak into this country as an alien and you begin to eat up the substance of the people and you take the jobs and you live on welfare and all this other stuff, and I, I wouldn't be mentioning this if it wasn't so big of a, pro a problem. But there are whole areas now, uh, the southern part of the United States, particularly in Arizona, where the police are losing control. And these Ill illegal aliens are coming in and they're shooting people. They're driving people out of their homes. Now, I'm not a militarist. I'm not saying we need to, we need to fight and develop a Christian nation. No. It's too late for that. But there will come a time where if welfare is ended and it's shut down, and you have all these millions and millions of illegals, they're going to go wild. And they're going to go and they're going to take what they want. All right? And I am not advocating killing people, but I am advocating personal defense. Because when they come, you are not going to be able to rationalize things with them. And let's just sit down and, and talk about it. No. I've been to Central America. I've seen how they live down there. Okay? They will steal Whatever they can. If it's not bolted down and it's not behind gates, it's going to be gone within 24 hours, <laughs> usually. Sometimes 48 hours. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. It just happens all the time. It's a way of life down there. And now they're here in America. And they are here illegally. Okay? Again, what is our system of law? Do we, why, I mean, we should be defending our system of law. And somebody comes into our country illegally and seeks to do harm to our country, kick them out. If they want to come here and live lawfully and obey our laws and, and everything, great. Hey, it's no different in, a, in the church here. Somebody wants to come in and they don't want to submit to the beliefs, the statement of beliefs that we have here and the laws that we go by. We're not going to do, oh, come on in, you know. We'll give you money and things. No. Out. Okay? That's the system that we need to have as people down here, as, as, as human beings. We need to have a system of law and order. Okay? And, it, and for a Christian, your main system of law is the written word of God. And this is what you submit to first. And as long as the secular law is in line with this book, then you submit to it. Okay? 
I go off on that for a long time, but let's continue here and then we'll finish up the message. Verse 35, women received their dead raised to life again and others were tortured, oh boy, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now, let me just say this here again. If you're tortured for being a patriot, you're not going to obtain a better resurrection. <laughs> if you're tortured for Jesus Christ, you will. Okay. Make sure your fight is the right kind of fight as a Christian. Okay. Uh, let me continue here. Uh, verse 36. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now, I believe... As a dispensationalist, I believe that the book of Hebrews and the book of James are specifically written not only to Christians. There's Christian doctrine in there, certainly, but specifically to Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, who is going to need those last couple of verses there more than a Jew living in the tribulation with the Antichrist hunting them down and the Antichrist armies? And we are headed that direction. How much of it will we get to see? Well, that kind of depends on how much you fight as a Christian. <clears throat> how much you get the tracks out there. See, if you, if you're every, you know, if every week there are tracks being put out as Christians and it's a normal common thing, the people see it. Oh, yeah, I've seen those tracks. So the government says, you can't do tracting anymore. It's, it's terrorism. And people go, it's not terrorism. I'm used to seeing it. But what happens when you have communities where no tracks are being put out, and where the churches are social churches, social clubs, the people aren't used to seeing evangelism. They aren't used to seeing tracting. So when the government says, hey, it's now illegal, they go, well, it probably should be. I'm not used to seeing it. See? The safest place to be as a Christian is on the firing line, is on the front lines of the battle. Okay? You want to you preserve things until the rapture? Work for the Lord. Fight for the Lord. If we are silent and we back off and we, and we just continually let the world push us back into a corner, we're going to be hitting verses 36 through 37 there. Sawn asunder, tortured, imprisoned. That's what we're going to be hitting. Every Christian, every nation where Christians go silent and they stop being in ministry, public ministry, every single one of them, it leads to torture and imprisonment. The best thing that you can do as a Christian is to be on the front lines of the battle. Because then the people are used to seeing it. Okay, and it won't seem like a weird thing that should be stopped. All right, turn to James chapter 1. We'll finish up here. And you say, well, I don't know, Brian. I, I, I kind of am hoping that I'm going to get out of this. You know, I, I'd, I, yeah, you know, I kind of have some faith and whatever, but I'm, I'm kind of hoping that I can avoid some of this. Well, let's see about that. Uh, again, here to the tribulation saints, but also good instruction and righteousness for us Christians today. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. Satan doesn't mess with people that aren't a threat. Verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You know, you're going to have trials in this life that are going to try your faith. You're going to hear attacks on the Word of God, the King James Bible, that are going to try your faith. You're going to hear things from atheists. You're going to hear things from mainstream media that are going to try your faith. And you're going to have to learn to have patience and learn to stand in those things and just say, I don't care what you say. I know I'm right. I can find the answers to this, but I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time on it. I have faith in this. And, you know, we read earlier there in 2 Timothy 4 where Paul said about that he kept the faith. 
finished his course and everything. And he said about how that there's laid up a crown of righteousness for him, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You know, there's a lot of Christians that are losing their faith in the rapture. They're not, they're no longer looking for Jesus Christ anymore. Now they're looking for the Antichrist to show up. You know, there's a lot of them, a whole lot of them. They gave up their faith. And let me tell you something. The longer we're here, the harder it's going to be to keep the faith. Very difficult. And if persecution does come to America, you're going to see these churches clearing out. You're going to see all these Christians. Oh, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. Oh, Jesus is so wonderful to me. Oh, Jesus, you know, Jesus is my homeboy. You know, they wear the T-shirts. You're going to see them going, Jesus, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know Jesus. No, no, no. You know, I, I don't know him. They'll deny him. They'll drop like flies. Okay, why? Well, if it becomes illegal, if it becomes something that you get imprisoned or tortured for, they're going to drop. They're not going to have faith. But you see, the trying of that faith, this trying that will come, and it will get worse and worse the longer we're here, that trying is actually a good thing. Because that trying of your faith worketh patience. And that's the kind of thing that you're going to be rewarded for. So I'm just telling you, I'm sorry, I can't be a modern preacher and tell you that things are going to get better. They're not. They're going to get worse. And your best bet... You know, uh, Ruckman brought up the point about we're in a rear guard action, which is a military term, meaning that we're surrounded, we're outnumbered, we're not going to have revival, we're not going to have a massive Christian presence rise up in America and retake the government, and we're going to be all fine and everything's going to be wonderful. Not going to happen. We are trying to hold the ground, and the enemy is approaching, the enemy has surrounded us, and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse until Jesus Christ lifts us out of here. Till we're called up. Till we hear come up hither. Okay? And the question is going to be, is he going to be taking you up as somebody with faith? Or is he going to be taking you up as somebody who lost their faith? And who is no longer faithful? That's the question. So that's it for this morning. Uh, thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.